very much pain. And this right. pain, uh, for me, this, uh, this is why our, our father is in exile. So there's so much work to do. And uh, it's not only by what I really said before, it's not only because uh, we need to learn Torah, but it's more to live Torah. When Absolutely. We, are, we need to be aware what, what we do and how we do and when we do. Right. I like your, your parable, not only because it you know, rings true, uh, and uh, as, a, as a father who's far away from his children, <laughs> I'm sure it's, a, it's, it's painful. And, um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a silver lining to this. Mm-hmm. Our sages teach us that, uh, you know, technically, if Hashem leaves the Beit HaMikdash, where does he go? Goes back to the heavens. He retreats from the world. He retreats to, and, and sort of disappears and, and is far and distant from us. The sages have a, a beautiful uh, interpretation <laughs> of... Uh, there's a number of verses which seem to indicate this, that uh, Hashem didn't go back to the, the heavens and, and he couldn't uh, allow himself to be so distant from his children. He went with us into the exile. And Imo Anochi B'Tzara, the Pasuk says that I'm with you in your troubles. And uh, so essentially when the Jews come from America, from South America, from, from Europe, wherever they come, back to the land of Israel, who's coming with them? You have to buy an extra ticket on the, on the airplane. <laughs> I don't know if one seat will be enough. Maybe first class is best. <laughs> the Shekhinah is coming back to the land of Israel with the Jewish people. He was exiled, he was with us, he was taking care of us, he enabled the Jewish people to survive 2,000 years. I don't think there's any other nation in history yeah, that, you know, I think that I read the, the Dalai Lama, you've heard of the, you know, the Tibetan, uh, uh, in, from Tibet, yeah, and he was in exile, and the, the Tibetans are in exile from the evil empire, China. Um, and he consulted many times with, with uh, rabbis and Jewish leaders. He says, we have to learn from you. Because uh, you know, we're in exile and we want to survive. And not to assimilate and not to, you know, to be protected and to, mm-hmm. to, to have our beliefs uh, uh, remain steadfast and to have a nation that that's, uh, you know, has its uh, path and its culture. This is a, you need divine assistance. It's not uh, something so easy. And, uh, you know, what's it been, uh, 50 years, 100 years for them, or less? Uh, you know, we've been 2,000 years, and the Jewish people are still alive. But, of course, many, many uh, are lost along the way, and B'nai Anusim and so forth, uh, most of them are lost. Mm-hmm. But maybe so they'll come back, but uh, it's a long process. But the point is, as sages teach us that, sure, God is an exile from the land. It's an exile from humanity. But not totally, not totally because he stays with the Jewish people wherever they are. And then our process of coming back to the land is a process of bringing the Shekhinah back to the land. So it's, it's connected. It's not like we can separate, oh, we're only doing political Zionism now. And then at the next step, we'll do some uh, religious revival. It goes hand in hand. Hashem says that I am with you in the exile. And so if the Jewish people come back, Hashem's not going to stay there. <laughs> What is he? He's a condominium in Florida that he's going to stay in? What, what does he have to do there if his people are, are not there anymore? If his people come back to the land, he will come back to the land. So we're sort of almost like forcing God's hand. <laughs> if we make Aliyah, if we get the Jewish people here, then uh, the divine presence, we are assured, will come back. And we will grow not only politically and, and you know, militarily and uh, demographically, but we will grow spiritually. And uh, it's not a, you know, we have to work, just like we have to work for the political Zionists, we have to work for, for religious uh, development. And uh, anyway, so this is why we still uh, talk about the, the exile and the destruction. The, politi- the, the, the framework of the story is the history, the facts on the ground. The first temple is destroyed, the second temple is destroyed, the different calamities which befell us. But it's all part and parcel with uh, the centerpiece is the Beit HaMikdash, which is a receptacle for the divine presence in the world. And, and when we talk about the things broken, 
It's not just that, okay, we were in place A, land of Israel, and now we're in place B, uh, you know, Sweden. C, D, E, E, F, G, <laughs> right? So many places we were dispersed to. But that's not just about geography. It's about a lower spiritual level. It's, 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 it's a breakdown in the way the relationship between God and the world is supposed to be. It was supposed to be much closer. It's supposed to have more, more uh, uh, morality in the world, more ethics in the world, more spirituality in the world, more connection to Hashem. Jewish people should, uh, should be living up to their potential to be the, the, uh, the holy nation as we talked about the other day, the, the kingdom of priests that can shine their light for the rest of the world. And so this is, uh, you know, everything that we're talking about during the commemorating the, these days of the destruction. You want to continue? I think there is uh, also a connection to the parasha we are talking about this week. <laughs> Uh, the journeys of the Jewish people. Right, because it's not the first time we read about the journeys. Uh, there were 42 places, locations where we have been. Actually, in the first year, we have been to 28 uh, locations, if I'm right. Okay. And But why do we need to repeat this? I think it's uh, something about, uh, we need to learn about the history, the, the moments uh, where we have been, what we did our mistakes we have done. And so I think it's uh, to memorize us uh, what happened in... in Remind the, us, yeah. Yes, and this is why we read it again. Sure. It's like uh, when this uh, this uh, father, he's going with his son. Uh, his son is very sick and he needs to go to the hospital. And this hospital is very far away. And they pass through all these locations and then they come to the hospital, they uh, help the son, and then they are going back. And on the journey back, the father say, oh, do you remember this place? We have sitting here, we slept here under the tree. And look at this place. Yeah, we, we pray to Hashem that everything will be okay. This will be, they will drink something. So he is going to, to uh, go back, what happened when they go to, to this, uh, uh, hospital, now they're coming back to give the remembering what happened in each place where they have been, and then they can learn about this situation. I think this is uh, the, the, the meaning of the parasha this week. And so yafe, yafe, yafe. Yeah, it's a midrash of Chazal, what you're quoting, this uh, this parable of the son and the father trace, retracing their steps and uh, the father reminding the son about you know all the difficult times they had. If you see it as part of a perspective of a successful journey, of the journey being, you know, being healed and going back home, uh, mainly all the, our discussions and all of our learning about the, uh, the history and the, the commemorations be part of the redemption process. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor. I'm, I'm, I'm down. Yeah. I, I kind of had a, a little insight as to the Shekhinah and the temple destruction. Uh, so... If we put things in order the way I see it, uh, misdeeds of Am Israel, uh, they drive away the, the Shekhinah, right? Correct. So if uh, the Shekhinah isn't in the temple, but we're still doing Korbanot, what that means is we're sacrificing to something else. Mm. And we're not sacrificing to, to Hashem. Precisely. So Precisely. Uh, the, the, problem. Temple, the temple had to be destroyed to avoid Abu Ghazara. That's true. And yeah. then uh, when the reverse happens, uh, when we talk about Teshuvah, Teshuvah is literally returned. And yes, there's a, 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 an element of it which is uh, us returning, but it's also calling back uh, the presence of the Shekinah Absolutely. To, uh, to return to, to Jerusalem. And when uh, that happens, then the temple can be built again. That's right. That's exactly right. That's the process that we're rebuilding ourselves, our, our society. And um, praying to Hashem <coughs> that he, uh, he return uh, in a greater way than before, more and more. 100%. Okay. All right. Let's open up our book of laws. We have a Prine Alacha book uh, that's called Zmanim. And in it, in chapter 8, there's the customs of the three weeks. 
And <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about the customs of refraining from meat and wine. We quoted the, uh, the overboard group yesterday who didn't want to eat any meat and wine the whole year, all of their lives. And then Rabbi Yeshua said it straight. He said, you can't, you can't commemorate the destruction in a way which will stop life. Perhaps one of the secrets, as I was saying, of the Jewish people, that we, we learned how to live in the exile without giving up hope for coming back. And uh, having these, these weeks, this period, during which the, uh, the mourning for the temple gets more, more severe is part of that. You know, there's, there's a, a process. You might uh, appreciate this. Yeah, there is elements which, which apply throughout the year. Yesterday we spoke about the Talmud saying you should, every house should have a ama al ama, a, a certain measurement of a, a square, which is not plastered. So to always remember, and the other customs. So we, we always have to remember the, the destruction of the temple, but it gets more and more severe toward, uh, during this period. So if you take a look, it's like a pyramid almost. Pyramid where during the year, we have a low level, a low grade of mourning. You know, maybe we'll uh, mention, we'll mention, uh, we'll break a glass at a wedding, at a special event, and we'll commemorate. But well, the rest of our lives, we, we have meat and we have wine and we celebrate and we build and we, uh, we enjoy because we have to, uh, you know, continue our lives. But then when we get, uh, you could say that the, uh, when we get to here, to the next level, this is already maybe starting the 17th of Tammuz. The three weeks, we have a period of, we're trying to be more aware of the destruction of the temple. It enters our consciousness more, no weddings whatsoever. Forget about getting married and breaking a glass. We won't get married for three weeks. That's the Ashkenazi custom anyways. Or we won't listen to music, if you will. The rest of the year, as I said, perhaps in another era, all year long, they didn't have music unless it was you know, a special event. But nowadays, we do listen to music all year round, except for during the three weeks. And then we have another stage, and that's the first of Av. Right? Well, that's what we're talking about now, the laws of the, the nine days. Right? And obviously here, the, the, uh, the, t- the ninth of Av is going to be the, the peak, the peak, the most intense of the commemorative and memorial uh, mourning practices. We actually sit on the ground. Do we have two levels? There are many levels, yes. This can be divided up even more finely, but uh, right now I'm just showing you the general structure. Yes, there is, there's... Uh, there's even within Tisha B'Av, there are different levels. It looks uh, like the pyramid of Maslow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, every pyramid looks the same, but um, there is a, a, a progression. There's a progression of more and more intensity of the morning practices. Okay, so we're up to this. We're up to this level right now. We're discussing the nine days, the practices to not have meat and wine. We're going to get into the details of that. But I can't stop myself. From showing you something else. <laughs> there is another process of mourning. This is the process of something we call national mourning. I think it, can, it can be considered a very old mourning because the destruction happened many, many years ago. And really, we, we live with very little, a very low baseline of commemoration, if it's in our consciousness, but it happened so long ago, we're not so aware. Every day you wake up in the morning. Some people do. They mourn the temple every, every night. You've heard of this custom to, to sit on the floor at, at midnight and to read yeah. Tehilim. It's called Tikkun Hatzot. It's what name, midnight. Some people do this every night. So that for them, the, the temple destruction is very present in their minds. But for most people, it's, it's a very low baseline. When you get married, you break a glass, you know, uh, but during this time of the year, once a year, we have this period where it gets more and more intense. We, we turn up the volume, as it were, 
or we turn up the intensity of, of the morning. This is the process of a national. It didn't happen to me personally. It happened to, so it's not natural for me to be so aware of what happened. But we train ourselves. We train ourselves to be part of the Jewish people. And to uh, Tisha B'Av, by the way, in Israel, it's, it's, it's uh, by law, it's a day of mourning. It's the national day of mourning. And uh, not everybody has to fast. That's personal, of course. But I think they have, you're not allowed to have uh, movies open and, and uh, theaters closed and, and even restaurants. I believe they have to close on the night of Tisha B'Av. This is, and it's, it's a national day of mourning. So, but this is part of educating ourselves, training us. There's another process. But there's also a link, I think, to the destroying of our own temple, what we carry inside. So I want to talk about the, the, the other kind of mourning. The other kind of mourning is personal. The personal kind of mourning was when a relative dies, someone close to you, your mother, your father, that's normal. It's part of the way of the world. When you get older, your parents get older. It's, it's worse when it happens the other way around, when a parent has to bury a child. But that happens. And, spouse, what happens, a brother, a sister. This is a personal mourning. And I just experienced it, I think it's, uh, what, four months ago? Something like that. It's a punch in the stomach. It's very intense. It's really uh, to, to experience someone close to you, a relative of yours dying. It's very, very intense. My sister, my sister died about uh, four months ago, yeah. Um, <clears throat> She, yesterday would have been her 57th birthday. Yeah, very young, yeah. Um, and there's laws of mourning right away. When your relative dies, you sit on the floor. You, uh, you have to mourn, and there's, there's a mourning meal where, where you eat special foods of mourning, and then you sit on the floor, and you don't go to work for seven days. There are different customs, yes, of course. But uh, the, the basic framework is, is, uh, is uh, generic to everybody who practices uh, Judaism. It's from the Talmud that there's uh, you know, a period of three days of crying where only the, the closest friends and relatives come to visit. And then there's seven days of Shiva. Shiva, the word Shiva is seven. So there's seven days where you don't go to work and people come to visit you and they come and give you comfort and they bring you food and... Uh, they sit and talk to you, and you speak about, you know, your, your, and you're not allowed to have marital relations, and you're not allowed to get married, and you're not allowed to have celebrations. You don't even bathe during the Shiva for pleasure. Hygiene is something else. And you don't anoint yourself, and you don't wear leather shoes. All the, the laws, the most intense laws of mourning that we're going to experience on Tisha B'Av, they, they appear... Uh, for each individual at their time for a personal type of mourning. But you know what's amazing? For personal mourning, I believe it works this way with a process, but exactly the opposite. It starts off most intense. Right away, you feel that, and, and the halacha expresses that. Like I said, all these customs. But after the shiva's over, you go back to work. Still, you don't shave. You don't get a haircut for 30 days. And you don't, uh, you don't uh, go to parties. And you don't buy new things. All the restrictions, they continue after the shiva. And then if you're mourning for your mother and father, there's some restrictions which continue an entire year. Till the end of the first year. After your parent dies, you're not supposed to attend weddings. And you're not supposed to buy new things and say, recite the Shekh it's, 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 uh, uh, And then after the year, you have once a year where you commemorate it. But what I like to do is the following. So there is this process of, of the most intense morning and the lower level of sort of baseline morning, but it works exactly the opposite. It starts, it starts, it starts at the bottom. At the, the highest, the peak of the morning for personal morning is, is the most intense at the beginning. But there's a process of slowly, each level 
you go back into life, you join life, you, you have to celebrate at some point, and uh, you live, of course, there's always going to remain a baseline of, of, of mourning. You are, you're not the same person if you have experienced uh, loss. Um, but uh, you could compare it, one more, one more parable if you like, and I'm glad you, you, you caught on quick. But I was drawing on my game, David. <laughs> the, the Jewish way in terms of mourning includes the national mourning, which is you know, a process to bring us, to train us to be more and more aware. And then we actually feel the destruction most on, on Tisha B'Av. And the opposite, when you have naturally, if it's a personal tragedy, you feel the, that, and then slowly but surely, you, you go back to life and, and uh, it, becomes, it becomes manageable and livable. You live with, with a, it's almost like when you get, unfortunately, uh, you get injured. Somebody takes a, he gets cut. Let's uh, keep it, let's keep it uh, not too intense. We'll just say uh, someone here rode his bike and he fell off his bike and he got uh, scratched and, and wounded and a big, uh, his skin got cut open and bleeding. And, and uh, so the first thing you do when you go to get first aid, <clears throat> so maybe you need stitches, but they put on lots of antibiotic cream to make sure you don't get infected. And then, you know, the area is all swollen and so you protect it with a big bandage and, and you you know, cover it up. And then after a week or two, you go back to the doctor and uh, you open up the bandages and you see is hopefully it's healing a little bit and you don't need as big a bandage. Maybe you have a little bit less. We can see it's not infected. All you have to do is keep it clean. Maybe there's some cream, but you don't need as much medicine and you put, down, put it on a smaller bandage. As time goes on, the, uh, the wound heals, and maybe you just need a little small band-aid over the most extreme scab so that the scab doesn't, doesn't get ripped off. And then ultimately, a few weeks later, however long it takes, you can take off the band-aid. You don't need anything. You don't need any cream. You don't need anything. You still remain many times with a scar. The scar is there. The, the remnant, the, the, the mark from the stitches might remain forever. But you go and you're, you're healed and you go back in life and you... So it's a similar process of, of uh, mourning. You know, it's, it's definitely an injury. It's an injury to your psyche, to your personality, to your soul. But um, the laws of mourning guide you to, to uh, deal with the pain, to deal with the loss. Most intensively at the beginning and then slowly but surely you learn to live with it. And, uh, and you go back to your, your you, that's what healing is. You go back to regular life. What we're doing now is the opposite. We've gone back to our regular life nationally. We live it. We've created a new Judaism with no temple. We, we, we're so used to it. To us, that's Judaism. We need to retrain ourselves to the opposite. We become more and more aware that there's something missing. We still have to mourn every year. On Tisha B'Av, in this three weeks period we're leading up to Tisha B'Av, we're training ourselves to, to remember and recall that we did lose something. And we, there's something that we have to work on a, a better a level of spirituality, a better society, better, you know, uh, whether it's uh, in terms of re religiosity or in terms of uh, geopolitical geopol uh, influence of the Jewish people. There's so much that we have to uh, remember. We're not. Uh, yet living the Judaism that we strive for. And this is the process of the three weeks reaching the ultimate uh, highest level of mourning on Tisha B'Av. Um, national mourning versus personal mourning. Yes, Ravi. When I'm looking to this uh, mind, I wish it's uh, it's a tough thing to feel. <laughs> because uh, I understand that the visual pain we have this time yeah, yeah. is this. Coming to be your collective uh, pain. Okay. And then Hashem collected the pain, and then He is bringing it down to the people by uh, giving the Torah. Ah. 
Yeah, yeah, you can play with this image and uh, just uh, do, do it in different ways, but uh, it's nice. Yes, uh, Hirsch, yeah. So on Yom Kippur, uh, lotion is a soap. Any rubbing with the, the melacha of making something rub so hard, it gets thin, thin out, smearing. Is that also so on Tisha B'Av, or? I'll tell you, I think you're, you might be confusing two things. Um, Yom Kippur, uh, we're not talking about Yom Kippur now, but there is there is two elements of Yom Kippur. One element is that there's afflictions. And afflictions, uh, the Torah says, you shall afflict yourself on that day. What does that mean? Well, the sages say it means don't eat, don't drink, don't have uh, relations, don't wear leather shoes, and don't anoint yourself. So these are the five restrictions which... Six? No, there's five. Uh, you count to Hebrew, eating, eating, and, eating and drinking is counted as one. So, um, Those are the five uh, classic restrictions on Tisha B'Av, uh, on, on Yom Kippur. They're very similar to Tisha B'Av. That's why yeah, I understand your, your thought process. However, um, and so there's laws that you're not allowed to anoint yourself because it's pleasurable activity. It's like, it's part of afflicting yourself. Then there's another element of Yom Kippur, which you may or not be aware of, and that is Yom Kippur is also like a Shabbat. It's called Shabbat Shabbaton. The Sabbath is Sabbath. And therefore, all the restrictions of Shabbat apply as well, which is 39 categories of work, um, of which one of them is the smoothing out process that you're referring to. And so the putting on lotions or creams could be permit, pro prohibited for two reasons on Yom Kippur. One from the angle of it's prohibited, it's considered work. And the other angle, because it's, it's pleasurable and you're not allowed to do, you're supposed to be afflicting yourself from these, these uh, defined activities. So that's a nice question. It's interesting. We're going to get to the laws of Tisha B'Av. We're going to talk about uh, anointing. We're not going to talk about the laws of prohibition of, of, of uh, Shabbat and Yom Kippur from that angle. But in terms of anointing, you know, all that's prohibited is, is the pleasurable aspects of it. So some people say you can put on uh, deodorant, for example. No, no. You're yeah. putting cream on you, but it's not for pleasure. It's just mm -hmm. to stop the bad smell. So uh, it, it, it's, it's permitted. Uh, Yom Kippur, uh, it, it might be, uh, you know, because it's Doraita, it's biblical law, I think you, you might be machmir. But uh, for Tisha B'Av, I believe it's allowed to put on deodorant if, if you, if you uh, are worried about stinking. Because it's not something you're doing for pleasure. It's not anointing like, you know, putting on perfume like many women do, you know, to, to smell nice. That's prohibited. That's exactly the prohibition of anointing on, on Tisha B'Av. But the deodorant is not quite perfume. Yeah. Another, another comparison between Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av is on Yom Kippur, we basically pray all day on Tisha B'Av. Is it praying all day, or is it like regular tefillah at times, just no eating, no drinking, no It's interesting. We, we, we do have a very special prayer service on Tisha B'Av. It's called reciting keynote. We're going to talk about that next week. We get closer to Tisha B'Av. We're still in the, in, in the first of Av. We're preparing for Friday, which is the first of Av, and we, know, we want to know how to act for the coming week. And so we're still learning those laws. We're, next week we'll be preparing for the actual fast itself, and we'll discuss in more detail those laws. But by all means, uh, you asked the question about uh, what do we do on Tisha B'Av. We'll discuss that as well. There are, there are, uh, there's an entire book of a prayer service. You could call it prayers. It's really poems of destruction. It's, it's lamenting. It's called lamentations. Uh, poems that describe lamentations. the destruction. Lamentations. Right? It's also the same word is used for a, one name of a book in the Tanakh. In Hebrew, Lamentations is the book called, in Hebrew, it's in the Tanakh, Eicha. Eicha. Take a look. That's, that's, so we do read the book of Eicha on the night of Tisha B'Av, and during the day we recite something called Kinot. Kinot. I might have more here somewhere. I think that's it. <clears throat> um, it's uh, on the on the left hand column. 
This is only in Hebrew, I'm sorry. I already gave you a list in English of the Tanakh. You can find it on the board over there as well. In the writings, you have the book of Eicha. It's number six, I believe, on the left-hand column. Is it six or seven? It's six. Six. Eicha, left-hand column. The left-hand column. Ketuvim, we have the five Megillot, of which Eicha is one of them. Tehilim Mishlei Iov. Those are the first three books of Ketuvim. And then we have the five Megillot. Shira Shirim, Ruth, Eicha, Kohelet, Esther. And so Eicha is number uh, six on the list of Ketuvim. Over here. Number six. <coughs> it's it's uh, tr- usually translated as Lamentation. Now there's another book which is not part of the Bible. It's actually a collection of poems, liturgical poems, piyutim, which all are sad. They're all about destruction, and they get another name called, uh, there's a special name for a a liturgical poem. Uh, It's called a kina. It's, It's different. It's different. Slichot is, is something else totally. Uh, it also many times appears in a separate volume, <laughs> and that we and we recite it in the synagogue, and so it's similar in that way. But it's a whole different structure, and it's a, and you know we recite the keynote sitting on the floor uh, on the day of Tisha B'av, and if you do it properly, it could take up all of the morning. You ask me about uh, comparing it to Yom Kippur. Yeah, if, you, if you're actually going to read through the keynote slowly, it's supposed to take you somewhere close to about midday. And then there's another half of the day. We'll talk about that. But again, we'll, you keep drawing me towards Tisha B'Av. I'm not there yet. <coughs> Still trying to discuss the week before Tisha B'Av. These books were written during uh, Jewish people's goth phase. God phase? Goth phase. What's the goth phase? What is that? Well, black, black, black makeup. makeup. Yeah. Black, black. <laughs> <coughs> uh, I see. Uh, um, <coughs> listen, we were persecuted in many different uh, eras, and uh, each era, unfortunately, they added an additional poem or some a description of the, you know, the pogroms in uh, in the Ukraine and in in, in the Crusades in, in Europe, and. Uh, there's descriptions from Chazal about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. There's a lot there, but we'll get to that next week. Next week. Hold your horses. Let's talk about the prohibition of eating meat and drinking wine during the nine days and everything else. So quickly, page 164. Page 164. Gavriel, will you read for us, please? The bottom, the, pro- the laws of eating meat and drinking wine. Prohibition of eating meat that includes all types of meat, uh, beef and poultry, fresh, frozen, and cured. Fish, however, is permitted. It is customary to be particular even regarding foods that were cooked together with meat. For example, if potatoes were cooked with meat, uh, one should not eat even the potatoes along, uh, the nine, alone during the nine days because the flavor of meat can be discerned in them. Uh, however, one may cook f- food in a pot that is usually used for meat, as long as the meat flavor in the food is not perceptible. <coughs> Grape juice is included in the prohibition of wine, but alcoholic beverages like whiskey and beer are permitted. Phew. One may also season a dish with wine vinegar, and that is a- an interesting thing because uh, if you talk to Muslims, uh, Muslims can't drink at all, right? And uh, if you tell them, oh, uh, you can use uh, vinegar in your cooking, no, no, you can't. Like, they don't we use vinegar, which to me makes no sense. But anyway. Interesting, uh, interesting. Uh, skip, we need to skip a little because we don't have time for everything. Yeah. But uh, <coughs> the question becomes, what do you do on Avdalah? Skip to the next, last paragraph on page 1A65. According to the custom of Sephardim... One person who recites Hadalah after Shabbat Hazan may drink the wine in the Hadalah cup. The entire king may drink the entire cup. Despite this, it's preferred to use grape juice, which does not bring joy. <laughs> uh, according to the custom of other Ashkenazim, 
uh, if there is a child present who has reached the age of Hinuk, for reciting. <coughs> who who uh, has reached the age of Hinuk? Yeah, go ahead. For reciting the uh, before eating, but does not yet understand why <coughs> we mourn over Jerusalem, age six to nine approximately. The person reciting Kabbalah uh, has a child in mind when reciting the Vilakha of Ha Gafen. Gafen. Uh, and the child drinks the wine. The wine, okay. Uh, if no such child is available, however, the adulthood recites Kabbalah drinks the wine. The, the other day we mentioned another context where <coughs> a child became useful in the synagogue. Remember that? Yesterday we talked about that. No, no. <coughs> what were we talking about? Identifying the letter in the Sefer Torah, mm. right? Yeah. So here too, we, we, uh, we're we blessed if we have children around. Because <laughs> they can become useful sometimes. <laughs> okay? What's, what's the age of Hinoch? Uh, well, here it's a six to nine, right? So, so the six. Right, of course. Anyways, it depends what, what context. It, it's not uh, so clearly defined. Next page, please. 166. Ariel, will you read for us, please? Page 166. We eat and wine on Shabbat Hazan. We eat meat and drink wine on Shabbat Hazan, as we do on every other Shabbat of the year. Our girls, even if Shabbat itself falls down on Shabbat, causing the fast to be postponed to Sunday, one may eat meat and drink wine on that Shabbat. One may even serve a meal as lavish as that of, that of King Solomon in his time. <coughs> there is no morning on Shabbat. So this is actually what we're going to do this year. We're going to have meat and wine not only on <coughs> this coming Shabbat, but also the next Shabbat, which is the Shabbat Be'av. We're going to have a Shabbat meal with meat and wine. And you know, it's strange. We mentioned that there's something called a mourner's meal. Usually that's the last meal before the fast. In the afternoon on the 8th of Av, we, have, we sit on the floor. We eat only one dish. And it's, also, it's, it's a mourner's meal. This year we don't have that. We have a third meal on Shabbat. We have a celebratory Shabbat meal. You could have meat at your Sudash Lishit. Like in a, 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 a meal as lavish as that of King Solomon. Because it's Shabbat. And that means that Shabbat's so special. That exactly. It sounds like divine presence is on Shabbat more focused, right? Absolutely. Can you say that? Absolutely. You can't say that. Like, we don't mourn. We don't have any practices of mourning on Shabbat. Right. And so on Shabbat, eat meat, drink wine, even if it's actually to Shabbat. And then immediately when Shabbat is over, we're going to see what we do about Havdalah. You can't make Havdalah. To Shabbat is a 25 hour fast. Mm -hmm. You can't make a bracha bar per gafen. You can't drink anything. You're fasting. So we're going to see later what we do about Havdalah. But first of all, Shabbat during the nine days, no restrictions. Okay? Both Shabbatot this year. Two Shabbatot. Nine days. Works out this year we have two Shabbatot. Okay? Keep going. In addition. Uh, you know what? Let's skip. Let's skip because... Um, Go to the following page, page 167. <coughs> the Achronim write... <coughs> go, go ahead, Ariel, you're reading. Uh, the Achronim write further. The Achronim write further. That one you know what? Actually, we start, we start in the middle. Excuse me. Uh, I, I skipped too much. I skipped too much. I skipped too much. It's not going to be uh, uh, understandable if I skip so much. There are... Go... Uh, just skip one, par one sentence. Page 166, in the middle of the page. Similarly, one may eat meat and drink wine. You see where that is? Similarly, one may eat meat and drink wine at Sirdat Mitzvah, such as a meal in honor of a Jirtalat, a Pidyon Halen, or a Siyum. One may also eat meat. Siyum, yeah. Siyum. One may also eat meat and drink wine at a Bar Mitzvah celebration, provided that it takes place on the day that boy becomes obligated in the Mitzvah. There are divergent customs, however, regarding the number of people one may invite to celebrate. <coughs> Some say that during the nine days, one must list, limit the number of people one invites to the celebrants plus an additional minyan of ten men. 
Others maintain that one may invite all the people who he would have invited had the meal occurred a different time. According to Herman, during the nine days until Shabbat Hazon, one may invite anyone he would normally invite, but during the week of the Shabbat, one should invite only a minyan of men. In addition to the celebrants, in practice, the halakhic ruling and practice varies according to the circumstance and the need. So I understand what is a, what, so if I have a baby, and the Brit Milah comes out to be during the nine days. Do I have meat and wine? I'm allowed to. The question is how many people to invite. But if I have a bar mitzvah, my son becomes bar mitzvah during the nine days. You want to make a celebration on the day of his birthday, 13th birthday. Yes, you're allowed to have meat and wine. What's the third instance he said? Ah, Pidyon Aben. Pidyon Aben. Redeeming the firstborn one month after the firstborn uh, baby. What's a siyum? You mentioned here, there's another su'udat mitzvah, a mitzvah meal, called a siyum. What's a siyum? A siyum is yes. a Ash. gathering of, among Protestant Jews who basically oh. celebrate the uh, finishing of a book, more specifically a masechtot in a uh, tamur. Yafe, yafe. Siyum actually means completion. You complete a course of study, it's a, of Torah, it's a mitzvah to celebrate. Okay? So if you're studying Talmud, you complete one masachet of Talmud. There's 63 of uh, 37 of them, actually. Then you complete one of them, you make a party. Yep. It's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to make a party on the day that you complete a course of study. It's called siyum. Siyum means to complete. The Hebrew word is samich yod vav mem sofit. See you to finish as it's yeah. I'm not separating uh, in one week as you It's a good question. It's a good question. As you said uh, nicely, the standard tradition is when you finish a masechet, one volume of the Talmud, mm -hmm. out of the thirty-seven. But any significant, really, when you when you actually look into the halacha, and this is uh, something that the various poskim discuss, anything that's a serious course of study. If you are studying Mishnayot and you finish an entire seder of Mishnayot, one of the six orders of the Mishnah, you could and should so probably make a suit. If you were studying for a long time this book, and it's a, how many pages? 300 pages book, 350 pages, and you're very happy. I've completed an entire volume of, of the series. I think it's worthwhile to make a siyum and, uh, and celebrate and have meat and wine. What, what yes. Yeah, I think it's 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 um, as I said, the classical standard is, you know, a, uh, a book of the Talmud or a book of the Mishnah of the original sources. However, when you when push comes to shove, and there are many poskim who say any serious course of study, if it's a long and and intensive process that you went through. Uh, Even if it's like college? No, it has to be Torah. We're celebrating Torah. If it's in college, I don't care where you're studying, but if you're studying Torah in a, <coughs> in a serious and intensive fashion, uh, and you uh, finally complete a project that you're working on, that's what a siyum is. And so uh, I would say you could make a siyum if you finished this book, for example, from cover to cover. It's a serious project. It's a. It, it's not. It's not something that you do lightly, and you should celebrate whenever you progress in your learning. You should celebrate. You, you know. Uh, you could say, "Well, I'm not finished yet." <laughs> Are we ever going to be finished? <laughs> but you have to make markers. You know, we're humans. We need to to feel accomplished, and so if it's a significant uh, portion of that's definable, easily definable. And, and you've completed, even though there's, you know, another volume, okay? We finished this volume, there's another volume. Doesn't matter. This is a significant uh, section of learning. You can make a celebration, and you should make a celebration to, to celebrate that you're investing in, in your time in, in doing something worthwhile, studying Torah. Now, what happens if you're studying Torah, you've been going to a weekly Torah lesson, Shi'ur, and you've been studying, let's say, Masachat Brachot here. I have it on, the, on my uh, table here. Masachat Brachot. It's a big book. Let's say you finish this, okay? 
Masechet Brachot is the longest uh, Masechet in all of Shas, in all of the Talmud. It's, uh, not in terms of pages, but in terms of words. It is the most words of any, any uh, tractate of the 37. Who counted? I count it now. There's, there's computer programs that count for us now. But people do count. This is precious stuff. Every word is precious. So, and it turns out we just finished. We went, you know, page after page. We, maybe we met for, uh, for uh, an entire year. And we finish, and it's the nine days. Can we have meat and wine at our celebration? Yes, you're allowed to. Because it's such, it's considered to be a meal of a mitzvah. What makes a meal of a mitzvah? Well, brit milah is a mitzvah, so it's a mitzvah meal. Pidyon Aben is a mitzvah, so it's a mitzvah meal. Learning Torah, completing a section of Torah, is a mitzvah. And so the meal you have to celebrate finishing, completing a siyum is a mitzvah meal, and therefore you're allowed to have meat and wine, even though... It's during the period of the nine days when usually we don't have meat and wine. Okay? It's a beautiful thing. It shows you how important it is to study Torah and to celebrate it. So now, if you don't, uh, you cannot miss the, the, the meat and the wine? That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so the truth is, I know uh, it's a little bit of a trick. <laughs> Let's say you didn't study, but you really want to eat meat. During the nine days. So you make some friends. And you say, I see you're about to complete Masachat Brachot. Invite me to your party. (laughs) I didn't study anything. He studied. But he's allowed to have a party. And he's allowed to invite his friends. So make friends with him. As a matter of fact, some people, they even take this to the extreme. Is it so hard not to have meat for nine days? Uh, it's not even nine days, because Shabbat you're allowed to. So it's eight days, or even seven days, because there's two Shabbatot within nine days, sometimes. And sometimes, this year, there's two Shabbatot, so it's only seven days. Anyways, you love meat so much, and you know, I don't like fish, personally. I don't like, like it so much. So seven days, I'm, I'm a hungry, I'm starving. I need a seal, but I didn't learn anything. Make friends. Milah. So you, where is their Brit Milah, you, or where are they making a seal? There's in town you can find a meat restaurant doesn't want to lose customers and so they advertise they say if you come to our meat restaurant during the nine days every night at 8 p.m. we've invited in a Torah scholar who is making a siyum (laughs) and so he's going to invite all the people coming to the restaurant he's never met before that they should be joining his party that is not, I think, a proper. That's a loophole, yeah, right? right? They're using the halachic system in order to make money because they want to sell their meat, uh, right? Uh, it's not really, are you really happy that you're celebrating <laughs> the Torah learning? You want to have a hamburger, that's all. So, so some people do that, but the truth is, you know, I, we, we laugh because I gave you an extreme example. But the, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, encouraged all of his students to, uh, to make siyumim, the plural of siyum is siyumim, to make these celebratory meals as much as possible. I guess the theory is, what he was thinking is that we've had too much sadness and destruction. The Jewish people are estranged. They run away when you talk about mourning and sadness we want to be happy. And so we have to attract the Jews back to their heritage. And the only thing that's going to be attractive to them is joy. We have to celebrate our Judaism. So even though it's a loophole, if you keep by the laws and you have somebody every day that's finishing, a completing a, you know, a Torah series of learning, a book, he encouraged people to plan your course of study so that every day during the nine days you should have a siyum and eat meat and drink wine and that's going to bring the redemption more than the, the being sad. This is, was his approach. Not everybody agrees with it. But, uh, you know, I see, I see that the, the logic to it. It's a little bit of a loophole when it comes to the laws of destruction, uh, you know, mourning and destruction. But the idea, you know, he's the bigger picture. 
of you know bringing the Jewish people back and and uh, uh, if someone is doing it for the sake of educational purposes, I can see that being justified. But if you're just doing it because you love hamburgers, I don't know. I don't know. Let's see it inside now. Uh, page one eighty sixty seven. Go ahead. Uh, the Achronim, Ariel, you're reading. The Achronim write further that one should not intentionally schedule a siyum for the nine days in order to permit the consumption of meat and wine, as this is a willful abrogation, abrogation of the morning Torah. Violation is another word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rather, only one who happens to complete a unit of Torah study during the nine days in the course of his regular studies may organize a festive siyum meal. So he's, uh, you can see there's a footnote here. It's a long discussion. Many people, for example, uh, many uh, summer camps, right? Uh, for some reason, the nine days always come out during the summer. Little kids, many of them are not bar mitzvah. <coughs> and there's a kitchen that's feeding them. So, uh, you know, kids need their spaghetti and meatballs, or they, they, they need to have their, their, their diets where they need the iron, and the, there's health restrictions, you know, there's, there's rules about how much you have to feed the kids. If they don't feed the kids their chicken, the parents are going to complain, you're not feeding my child. Right? So many camps, they actually make a seal every day for their, you know, because, you know, uh, the circumstances, but should you try? Here, he's not such a fan of this idea of trying to make sure you finish and have a seum during, during the nine days. If it happens, you've been studying, and now's the time to celebrate. By all means, it's fine. Um, but uh, trying to make one just so that you can eat meat might be... Uh, but the truth is, something else that usually happens during the, uh, the nine days... Uh, other than summer camps, is in the yeshiva schedule, it's the end of the year. Right? This is the end of the semester. The semester ends with Tisha B'Av. Mm -hmm. So almost every year, I make a siyum with my students to celebrate siyum mm -hmm. during the nine days. And we have meat. I also, because I like meat. <laughs> but, 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 but I believe... <laughs> Sometimes, uh, usually we go out, sometimes we have burgers bar, it depends. But, um, you know, each, each year is a little different. Are we actually completing a section of study or not? Um, so there is that option of you're actually making a siyum because it's the end of the semester. And so you, if you've been studying Torah all, all semester long, and, and if there's one topic that you've covered and finished and you can, you know, celebrate it, I think it's educational to, to, to realize we should celebrate yes. studying the Torah and every year when we go, uh, they are in Burger's Bar, they're waiting for us. Because they know they're, they're very, relatively empty during the nine days. Because people are not having their, their meat. Because not everybody's religious, so they have some business. But they say, oh, you're the guys that are making the seal. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> they, they remember us from year to year. So that's... Uh, it's a bit ironic. Nice. Yeah. Uh, you complete the study of... The, the, the laws of the nine days and then celebrate on the nine days. <laughs> that would be uh, the ultimate irony. I agree. I agree. Okay. Next page. Next. Other things restricted. Yeah. <laughs> Good thinking. <laughs> we usually don't make a siyum when we finish uh, the... Torah reading of the, the Parshat HaShavua. Mm -hmm. We're finishing Sefer Bamidbar, you're right. But is that an intense Torah learning? You listen in shul once a, once a week, you know, maybe, you, you know, we read, we don't actually study. Mm -hmm. This is more like a formal public reading of the Torah. It's true, everybody should be studying the Parsha, uh, but uh, the custom is not to make a siyum on... Uh, because we're finishing Bamidbar. You're right, we are finishing Bamidbar this week. But it's Shabbat, anyways. Anyways, <laughs> anyways we're having meat and wine on Shabbat. <laughs> if you were to finish on Sunday, then you'd, be, you'd get an extra meat meal. <laughs> Good idea, though. Good idea. Yeah, we all finish uh, the book of Bamidbar. We say, Chazak, Chazak, Renit Chazak. We spoke about it yesterday. Okay? Next, other customs that we have during the nine days, building and planting. If it's a, 
you know, a joyous type of, uh, of construction. You're adding a room, you're, you're uh, repainting the house for pleasure. That's not, should not be done during the nine days, but if you're just, you know, the wall's gonna fall down. <laughs> you need more room for your kids, so then that's not uh, something of joy. It's allowed to do. I got asked this year by, uh, people ask me questions, I am a rabbi. So uh, about a, construct, a renovation project, family was redoing their house, and they were planning, do we have to stop during the nine days? So it's complicated, the laws are a little complicated, right? They're not doing the work themselves, a, a, a kablan, a contractor is doing it, a non-Jewish, an Arab contractor is doing it for them. If possible, during the nine days is best not. The three weeks, I, they're allowed to do it. Also, it was they were describing to me that it's something that's necessary. It's not really just for joy. All sorts of... Uh, each, each circumstance is a little bit different. But um, that's the concept of, you know, uh, planting for joy. This year, we're not planting much anyways because it's the Shemitah year. Let's keep going. Uh, most of us are not going to be building business transactions... They're not really prohibited, but if you look on page 170, I'll just briefly mention the bill, the 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 uh, what the halacha says about business transactions. One second. Shabbat is the. It's the last Shabbat uh, before, right before the Shabbat. Yeah, we curtail. It says on page 170. Everybody, see where I'm reading? Number 18. We curtail joyous business transactions during the nine days. That is to say but may not buy luxury items like jewelry, clothing, fancy appliances, new furniture, or a car for personal use. Uh, there's a fellow here getting married right after Tisha B'Av. And so we discussed the issue, can he make purchases for his new home during the nine days? No. <laughs> he had to do it beforehand or afterwards. But uh, really, it's uh, not, not so simple. Throughout the three weeks, one may not purchase anything that would require him to recite Shekhyanu. So that, you know, we mentioned already that you say the Shekhyanu when you use it. You use it on Shabbat, it's okay, not, not during the weekdays. But uh, anyways, um, at the bottom, of course, page 170, whoever wants to be an anti-Semite can laugh. However, if one comes across an opportunity to buy an item that brings joy at a bargain price, <laughs> you find something on sale <laughs> and is afraid that he will lose this opportunity if he waits until after Tisha B'Av, he may purchase it during the nine days. However, it is best to bring it home or begin using it only after Tisha B'Av, as we said. Right? Anything that's going to you know, cause you unneeded loss, that's per per permitted, but... Um, it, there's more details. I want to talk with you the issue about laundry because laundry, very practical, uh, is something we have to consider uh, for the next uh, page 172, please. Page 172. We'll start discussing it now. We will um, see if we can do it today. If not, we'll, we'll finish tomorrow. Prohibition on laundry. Okay, page 172. Um, uh, Pinchas, can you read for us page 172? Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. So the concept is that laundry is something joyous. <laughs> I know you would, you would maybe not consider it just to be a, an onerous task, but uh, I want to uh, describe to you something I saw myself, but uh, maybe you've seen it once or twice as well. Um, in the ancient world, or in a um, less industrialized world, laundry, if you don't have running water, saw this in Africa, the, usually the, the women of a small town gather together and they go down to the river mm -hmm. to wash the clothes in the river and they do it as a group. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and, singing. and they're singing and they're, you know, it's colorful because the clothes are, are full of colors and it's a little bit like a party. Laundry can be a party. 
Now, this, as I said, we don't really experience it that way. We, we throw it in the machine and, you know, it's just a task. But laundry is, uh, you know, if you can imagine in the day when they didn't have so much clean clothes, you, uh, you were very happy to be wearing fresh, even today, it's, it's exciting, it's nice, it feels good to wear clean, freshly laundered clothing. And so this concept that it, it's associated with joy is the way the halakha treats laundry. Um, this, this, uh, halakha the this is halakha, uh, as he said, he quotes here, prohibited, yeah, the, the, from the Mishnah it says that you're not allowed to do laundry during the week of Tisha B'Av, right? This is halakha. Um, now, we're going to see how to apply that nowadays. Um, but it goes on a little bit. He says, even if you're going to wear them after Tisha B'Av, it's not just about wearing the clothes, which you can more identify with and say, it's, it's fun, it's pleasurable to put on freshly clean clothes, but even laundering it for afterwards is prohibited. We don't do laundry during the nine days. Uh, and that's explained based on this, you know, what I, what I, the context I put it in, that it, the event itself is joyous. It's, 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 it's uh, almost party-like, or it was, at least in the times of the, of the uh, sages. And so, yeah, laundry is a prohibition during this period. Uh, again, if your Sephardim starts the week of Tisha B'Av this year, there is no week of Tisha B'Av, according to most poskim, so there's room to be lenient. But according to the Ashkenazi custom, it's nine days without laundry. Many, many homemakers who every day do laundry, ah, they feel a little bit of a vacation <laughs> during the nine days. For Sephardim, this year, this, this doesn't apply. And they're eating meat and drinking wine also. Up, yeah, all the way up until it's not on the Shabbat, but the, uh, but yeah, yeah, up until yeah, up until yeah, yeah. Ravi, do you have a question? Uh, I'm just thinking. Suppose I'm a very poor man. Yes. I'm only in one shirt. It's coming up. It's coming up. He relates to it. Okay. Um, let's uh, see where he says that. <coughs> now wait, wait a minute. If I'm not allowed to wear freshly laundered clothing for nine days. Shabbat is accepted. We'll talk, we'll talk about Shabbat uh, probably tomorrow. But uh, so seven days, whatever. So I do the laundry before the nine days, of course. I make sure all my clothes are clean. But every day, when I put on a fresh pair of pants, and I take out a fresh shirt, and I put it on, I'm wearing freshly laundered clothing. Even though the laundry was done earlier, now I'm wearing it. You're not allowed to put on freshly laundered clothing. So what do we do? Wear it before. Right, you've, you've before been around then. for a while. Weird. There's the concept is that the first time you put on uh, freshly laundered clothing, it's exciting. Mm. But if you wear it once, I don't know, for an hour, for half an hour, before Tisha B'Av starts, before, before the nine days start, and then you put it aside. It's still clean. And so then later on, during the nine days, you can re-wear the clothing because it's not fresh. It's not the first time you're putting it on. And so if you look on page 173, it says, since the prohibition on wearing laundered garments lasts for several days, there is a custom to prepare a sufficient amount of worn clothes <laughs> for this period. The procedure is follows the prohibition before the prohibition takes effect. When does the prohibition take effect this year? According to Ashkenazi. When does it start this year? No. No. Thursday night. Yeah. Right? Friday is, is Rosh Chodesh. So at the beginning of Rosh Chodesh, you're not allowed to do laundry anymore, and you're not allowed to put on freshly laundered clothes. So before Thursday night, today, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all day, at some point, take all your clothing that you think you're going to be wearing over the next week, and you put it on. One must wear multiple articles of clothing in succession, each for about an hour. 
This way, the garments are no longer considered fresh and laundry, and thus may be worn during the prohibited per period. One who did not manage to, then there's, a, there's, there's, there's loopholes. But essentially the ideal is, and we're going to talk about all the loopholes and all the limitations, but this is the concept of pre-wearing your freshly laundered clothes before the nine days start, before the period of the nine days start. Okay, is that clear? What are the exceptions? Exceptions are Shabbat. If you look at the top of the page, it says, in honor of Shabbat Chazon, however, even Ashkenazim customarily wear freshly laundered Shabbat clothes. All right, there's, a, there's, there's a debate, but this common custom is you wear regular Shabbat clothes, even if they're freshly laundered, for Shabbat. Another exception is underwear and socks. They're not joyous. They're just to keep you clean. They're just for your hygiene. And uh, they're types of clothes which are meant to absorb perspiration. It's not about uh, you know clothing, which is beautiful, which is you know, enjoyable, and so you don't have to worry about that. So really, what are we left with? Pants and shirts. I um, spoke to a rabbi, it's a rabbi of a very large community in America for 30 years, and uh, he, he would come every year in the summer to the yeshiva where I was studying and learn. He made himself a week off to go and learn in yeshiva, so he sat in yeshiva, so I had a conversation with him, and he told me that his ruling is Nowadays, these kind of shirts that we wear, he considers them to be like undershirts. We change them every day. They get, we perspire, in Israel at least. Uh, 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 if you change your shirt every day, that's considered to be like, uh, it's like underwear. It's something that you wear to absorb sweat, and therefore you don't have to wear it. What's left? Uh, Pants, maybe. <laughs> pair of slacks you could wear for a couple days. And so wearing a fresh pair of slacks would be problematic. Again, not everybody agrees with that rabbi's idea. And so, yeah, I usually do try to put on my shirts and my pants uh, that I think I'm going to wear over the next week before Rosh Chodesh starts. The other, uh, we'll finish with this loophole, and then we'll finish, we'll finish this discussion tomorrow because we're running out of time. The last thing I want to, and we'll have to talk about children's clothes. Of course, children are always going through clothes, especially babies. Uh, you know, you could wear four or five different uh, outfits of of, uh, of of shirts in one day, so it's it's almost impossible not to do laundry. But uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. The last thing I want to say for today is that there's another loophole. What happens if you didn't do this preparation Thursday? You were planning to do it, and then you got busy with something, and now it's already Rosh Chodesh. It's a few loopholes. You could say, well, Shabbat, we're allowed to wear freshly laundered clothing. So put on lots of clothes on Shabbat. But then you're preparing on Shabbat for the weekday, which is something you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> so the other option is there's a loophole, it says it here in the text, that uh, some people say, to take away the fresh laundered feeling, you put it on the floor for a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you pick it up and then you, you, know, you, uh, you fold it away and then you wear it during the week. But whatever, to take away that, that first freshly laundered wearing experience, that's what you have to do in order to be able to wear your freshly laundered clothing during the nine days. Um, as I said, it's, it can be limited by these other considerations. But uh, don't forget. Don't forget. Do it. Uh, prepare yourself. If you're Ashkenazi, of course, this year. Yeah. So this, this year, uh, right after Shabbat, so would you recommend this? Wearing to the no, no, you no. should not wear Shabbat clothes on Tisha B'Av. That's too festive, and you change. But we'll discuss that next week. We're going to discuss exactly the procedure okay, so moving wear, from Shabbat. So wear something regular on the day before Shabbat for only one day, and then change it to after Shabbat. Right for Tisha B'Av, you should have non uh, uh, not freshly yeah. laundered clothing at least, at least for one day. Yeah, even Sephardim this year have to be aware of that. Good, good point. Okay, we'll stop here and we'll continue tomorrow. Yeah. Talit katan, I I consider it clothing as well. Yeah, if it's freshly laundered, you shouldn't wear it. You should prepare it. Yeah, I mean, I don't launder my talit katan so often. I wear an undershirt, and then my talit katan. I have three layers, right? Um, 
how I'm comfortable with that. Everybody's a little different. Some people get hot, but I, mean, I don't mind it. Um, and that way, so the talit katan, it's not, I wear, I rarely launder it. It ruins, mm-hmm. it, sometimes it, the strings could get ruined during the wash, in the washing machine. There's, there's methods, there's methods, but also wool, I wear wool. Um, so we'll talk about it when we speak about tzitzit. Wool, each time you launder it, it gets more yellow. So I try to avoid laundering my tzitzit. If, if it doesn't get sweaty, you don't have to. So... Um, but everybody, you know, you're allowed to. There's nothing wrong with laundering and washing your, your tzitzit. Uh, so, uh, but if it's freshly laundered, I don't think you should put it on. Uh, tov, we'll stop here. Continue tomorrow.